Okay, thank you. Uh, so my name is Sudeep. I'm a senior machine learning um, researcher in the personalization team at Netflix. Hi, my name's Ash Fenton. I manage one of the machine learning teams at Netflix. So um, I, I'm sure like a lot of you in your day-to-day -day life, uh, you know, work with a lot of data, and you slice and dice a lot of data. And because you're here, um, assuming most of you use Spark or Scala, and so this experience that I, I, I often have is something you would probably appreciate, which is you know, doing something in a Scala notebook, you're slicing and dicing a, a Spark data frame, and you come to this point when you say, ah, if I only had something like matplotlib, I could have plotted this out. I wanted to really visualize these data points with error bars on them. I would really like to plot something which is not simple, like a simple bar chart, something which is slightly more complicated, maybe with a couple of layers in it. And so, this is sort of what motivated us to bridge the gap of visualization in the Scala world with having something which is similar or maybe a little more elegant than matplotlib, and we are calling it Vegas. And the reason behind the naming is it's Vega plus Scala, and we'll get to know by the end of the talk what that exactly means. But essentially, it's a visualization um, tool for Scala. It's a DSL for generating visualizations, and you can basically go to that website and start looking at the nice plots we have as we talk. So um, just to give you a bit of, uh, you know, just to take a step back, and because we are in the machine learning space, we are in the machine learning research space, why are we talking about visualizations, right? And why did we, did we have this need of uh, creating our own visualization tool? It's because we are a heavily ML-driven company. So at Netflix, we use machine learning everywhere. And I just want to make the connection of where a machine learning researcher's life connects with good visualizations. So at Netflix, when you log in, every piece of um, you know, items that you see on that um, page that you log into, there is machine learning somewhere in there. So when you look at the billboard at the very top, it's personalized. You know, when you look at the evidence that we are showing you, you know, to start the, the reviews, the ratings. There is machine learning behind that. Then if you look at these rows, which are obvious, like, you know, trending now has to have some sort of machine learning behind it. There are all these genre rows, rows like vintage crime or, you know, movies with strong female lead. Obviously, they are, again, generated by personalized and, you know, machine learned models. But also this entire page, the composition of this entire page is done through machine learning it's optimized, it's personalized. So we took another step recently where we went global. So Netflix is basically you know, almost everywhere now. And that brought us you know, even newer challenges in the machine learning world. So these algorithms that we were working on had to be global. And that again kind of connects with you know, the visualization world in the sense that a researcher now is not only going to be satisfied as looking at the metrics from, you know, sort of the global data set or US only, he would like to go and generate a plot that's facetted by countries, right? So those kind of, um, kind of you know, hand uh, curated visualizations are very hard to do, you know, in the current state uh, in, in, in a Scala notebook, for example. So, with all these things going, going on at Netflix, you know, we, are, we are constantly innovating. We are, we are you know, really pushing the boundaries of machine learning. And what, does, what that does to us is that our machine learning systems um, start to look really, really complicated. Um, here is a real life workflow which is you know, going through various different versions of a model and training and retraining and you know, doing a lot of uh, data cleaning in the beginning. But, as a machine learning researcher, when you're actually working on something as complicated as that, what helps is at every step, if you had visualizations to guide you through that innovation cycle. So this is what you know, we think of how visualizations help with machine learning. So initially, when you're looking for opportunities to where, you know, where, where, where does the next opportunity lie, it helps with guidance. So you can plot that data set, you can look at, oh, here's a tiny set of people who it doesn't seem to be that happy with our service, so what can we do to make them happier? And then, um, while you're building a model, what is the model doing internally? So that introspection step is again helped by visualizations, right? And then once you've built the model, trained the models, you know, you, you evaluate it, and at that evaluation step, you'd like to do something like, okay, let's break up this metric by country, and, you know, plot it out as a function of countries. 
So that's the evaluation cycle again. You know, it's, it's really, really helped by visualizations. And at the very end, if you're a machine learning researcher, if you're going to go up to the program manager and say, oh, here is something cool that I found, and this is the result, you're not going to probably show him a big spreadsheet, but you're going to probably show him a nice visualization. So visualization is, you know, really a day-to-day, -day very, very important uh, tool that a machine learning researcher at Netflix or basically, basically everywhere uses. And what can be a little painful about these kind of visualizations that I've been describing is that they can become very painful, especially if the visualizations have various aspects to it. So say I have a machine learning researcher and I want to do uh, this, this plot at Netflix. Say I want to find the five most popular titles according to the total number of views that they had in the last five hours as bar charts that's facilitated by country. So I want to make a separate, separate bar chart for each country, right? And then I also want these videos to be color-coded by the video age, like how fresh that video is on the Netflix system. So if you look at this, it seems like, you know, a kind of something simply put in a single sentence that could be done maybe easily. <laughs> it's easy to ask for. But if you look into it, there are various different things that's going on, right? So basically, if you're looking for the five most popular title, it brings in the notion of sorting. Then you're saying, you know, in the last five hours, so you have to do something with timestamps and filtering. And then you have the aspect of faceting by country. So that's like aggregating and grouping data by a nominal uh, a value, which is country in this case. And then the color coding, again, is mapping a quantitative um, aspect, which is the time, like the timestamp uh, of the, how old the video is, to a color, right? So in the typical matplotlib, or what's called the imperative way of visualization, what one would typically do is you could do all these things as pre-processing of the data frame. So basically you can go and have this data in the data frame and then first do the sorting, find the top five titles, then do the aggregation and filtering by timestamp, then, then do grouping by country and produce like X different little data frames which you then plot through a loop into different bar charts. But what Vegas does by way of being what we call a declarative statistical visualization grammar is you can basically specify all these things that I just described as um, a nice, simple, concise statement saying, here is the data frame. Take this quantity and put it on the x-axis, put it on the y-axis, do these aggregations and binning, and then visualize it with these bars or circles or bubbles, right? So it's declarative because you're saying what to do with the data set and not how to do it. The how to do it is all abstracted inside the, pro inside the tool. And then it's statistical because most of the simpler, you know, filtering, aggregation, faceting, as well as uh, descriptive statistics, they're also built into um, the tool. And then it's a grammar because you're basically using very simple high-level abstractions to, you can, to create a very complex visualization. So you start with the data, you apply some transforms to it, you say how you want to scale the data to visual aspects on the canvas, and then you say, okay, this is how I want to put guides on the, on the, on the canvas and put the marks on for each data point, you know, either it's a bar or a circle or whatever it is. You basically specify all those things in a simple, concise statement. And Ash is going to go through all these examples. Um, so here is uh, kind of a you know, illustrated example of what I was just, this concept that I was just talking about. So here we have a data set which has um, horsepower, miles per gallon, and origin of cars. And we wanted to visualize it and show off all the different elements that I just talked about. So first you basically go and say, you know, you load that data set and you say, horsepower is going to be my X axis, miles per gallon is going to be my y axis. And there is this concept of channels, which again, Aish will talk about in more detail. And you can say, you can basically declare this variable horsepower as my x axis. And then you go ahead and say, okay, I now want the origin of the country, the Europe, Japan, USA, um, to be mapped to a color channel. 
or a shape channel. So you have different shapes for different origins. You can have different shapes for different colors, uh, for different countries. And then again, if you had another aspect of the data, you could visualize that too by varying the shape. So here we are reusing the horsepower again to actually map it to the size of the data point. So there's a size channel again. All right. And all these things we did basically by writing maybe six lines of code. And, and that's basically, you know, sort of the introduction or more of the conceptual parts of the, of the Vegas um, tool. And now I'm going to hand it over to Aish to sort of go through the more nitty gritty details and uh, a lot of illustrative examples. Thanks. Thanks. Cool. Uh, so now I want to walk you through uh, some of the more nitty gritty, as Sadeep said. So talk through some of the features that we actually have in Vegas. Uh, talk a little bit about how it works behind the scenes so you have an idea of the technology behind it. Uh, and then we have a demo to end with as well, so you can actually see it in action. So, as you would hope, uh, Vegas supports all the basic plot types that you'd expect, right? So bar charts, scatter plots, area charts, stream graphs, uh, all the basic stuff you expect from charting, uh, Vegas has out of the box. Uh, so if you want to take log scales and all those sort of things, that's all built in. But it also supports more advanced pl plotting options as well. So uh, if you want to do something like a trellis plot, uh, if you don't know what a trellis plot is, uh, that's just a, a term that says that you want to present a whole lot of uh, small graphs beside each other across different rows and columns. It's a really good visualization technique for bringing out different segments of the data. So that's also built into Vegas. Uh, and you can get an effect like th this plot here with just a couple of lines of code. It supports different layers. So in this example here, what we're doing is we're overlaying several different aspects of the data onto one plot. So in the blue there, we have like the mean of this particular set of data. But now let's say that we also want to see the interquartile range of that data, of that distribution, mapped against the means. So it could be something like an error bars or something like that. So in yellow, we've done that over the top of it. And it just superimposes that on top. Uh, and then we can have another layer again where maybe you want to have something like the outliers showing, like I have in red here. Uh, and all of these things are just different layers in the plot that you can superimpose on one plot to bring out different aspects of the data. We support different ways to render the plots. The primary mechanism that we're using uh, is rendering it within notebooks. So we support Zeppelin uh, and uh, Jupyter out of the box. Uh, I'm sure we support Databricks too. Uh, we haven't tried that yet, but I think it should just work. Uh, and I think a little bit more novelly, because we haven't seen an example of anything quite like this in Scala, uh, is that we also support plotting within the terminal as well. So you can boot up your Scala console, and maybe you want to get a listing of files and you want to do a plot of uh, creation dates across your file system or something like that. So right from within the terminal, uh, your REPL, you can also do plotting. And we uh, pop up a window uh, to do the rendering for that plot, uh, and that works across Linux and Mac. So, as you'd hope, being at the Spark conference, uh, we also treat Spark as a first-class citizen within Vegas. So, if you want to map a particular uh, data frame within Vegas to, to plot it, uh, there's a command built in for that. So, you can just pass the data frame directly in uh, to Vegas to do the plotting. Uh, now, the advantage of this here is that we we use all the metadata that we get that's already baked into the data frame uh, straight into Vegas. So things like the column names and whether the particular columns are null or not and missing data. All that metadata we extract and it's there available for you to visualize. We support a number of advanced statistical options uh, built right in. So you have options for binning your data, sorting, scaling it, uh, we support custom transforms, so we have a little uh, DSL built into the language where you can specify uh, custom transforms on the data within JavaScript. We support time series information, so those of you who deal with uh, timestamps and dates probably know that uh, they often have extra things to think about when you're trying to visualize them, so we have uh, support for that built in. Uh, there's support for uh, aggregation, uh, so group by type ways of visualizing, filtering, 
Uh, we support all the basic math functions, so if you want to take the log or sine or cosine or all those typical type of math functions are built in. Uh, we have support for missing data as well, which is a very common thing in practice, that often data has noise in it and often data values are missing, and those have to be treated differently, so that's built right in. And we also support a number of uh, descriptive statistics. So if you want to get things like interquartile range, variance, medians, percentiles, all that could be just done in a couple of commands. So, how does it work? So, Vegas, uh, when you render it within a notebook here, so in this example we're in Zeppelin, uh, and what we've done is we specified our Vegas plot in the top there, and then underneath it's rendering in line within the notebook. What's actually happening is that first you're specifying it in Scala, uh, and this is done in Vegas, and what Vegas is doing is it's a DSL on top of a, a pre-existing JavaScript library called Vega Lite uh, that what we do is we generate the HTML <coughs> and we embed that back in <coughs> sorry, into the notebook as an iframe and then the actual rendering of that iframe happens uh, using the JavaScript libraries. So it's all rendered real time embedded within the notebook. Now the advantage to using this type of technology stack is that we can start to extend it in the future to do things like making the graphs interactive, which, are, which is the type of functionality that in traditional matplotlib type scenario is very hard to achieve, but it's a, actually a very natural thing to do here. So the technology stack that we're using is, so this is a DSL in Scala, uh, but underneath the scenes we are uh, resting on some pretty uh, amazing libraries already that have pre-existed. Uh, so Vega Lite and Vega are a JavaScript library used for visualization that's very feature rich, which is doing most of the heavy lifting behind the scenes to actually do the rendering, and we're wrapping that. And then they themselves are resting upon uh, the famous library D3, which is a JavaScript visualization library that supports a number of very rich options for visualizing stuff in JavaScript. So what we've done is we've packaged those together and we've tried to provide that bridge from being able to do this really easily and idiomatically in Scala and Spark while using these pre-existing JavaScript technologies. So I have an example now, so I'll talk you through it. So I'm not brave enough to do a live example, so I'm, go I'm going to play it instead, unlike the trainers here, which I think are, are very courageous for what they do. Uh, so first we import Vegas. Uh, so let's work with a data set here where we have population. Uh, so a very simple data set, age, uh, different populations for their age and sex. So we want to visualize that. So first we start up Vegas. Uh, we name the plot population, specify width and height. Uh, mostly here because I wanted to make it big enough to, so it was easy to see. So the first thing we need to think about is, okay, what data frame do we want to connect it to? So that's as easy as just going with data frame and passing in that population data frame. Now we want to wire uh, the age information in that data frame to the X column, and we want to say it's a nominal data type. Now in the Y column, we're going to say it's the number of people, and we go show, and here it is rendered in line. Now, let's say we want to make that a bar chart instead. So we just change the mark type, which is the, uh, how it's rendered on the screen to be a bar instead of a point, and it does that. Now, let's say we want to segment it by sex so we can see the differences between male and female. Now, we encode that particular data column uh, to a column, which now renders it as a trellis plot. In the second example here, I'm going to show you what we do with aggregation and binning. So we're going to work with the same data set. This time what I want to do is I want to see the number of people um, that we have uh, within each bin. So first I'm just going to say on the x-axis we've got the people and then on the y-axis I now want to say let's aggregate that so I can see the count data. So it's kind of like a group by. So we'll do that first and we'll mark it as a bar chart. Okay, so it sort of worked, but not really. Now the problem there is the x-axis, each one of those is quantitative data, so each uh, number, each population size was unique. So everything has a bin size of one. So now we have to bin it, so let's group it up a little bit more. Uh, and then maybe you want to have a little bit more definition in the data, so let's make the binning smaller. 
Okay, the final example I have here uh, is showing some of the, the different types of channels you can use within Vegas as well. So we've got a different data set now, we're working on cars, uh, and we want to visualize the relationship between horsepower and miles per gallon. So again, we just connect in the data frame by passing in the car's data frame. Now on this one, we want to encode first the X uh, position on the screen to be, let's take miles per gallon. And we're going to make the Y column horsepower. So first, let's just start simple. Let's just see as a scatter plot the relationship between those two. And I market them both as being quantitative data. Okay, so we'll mark it as a point and we'll show it. And you should see a scatter plot here. Uh, and as you'd expect, there is a relationship between those two. They are correlated, which is good to see. But now let's say we want to see how the origin of where the cars come from maybe impacts things as well. So which country made them? Uh, some countries may be producing higher horsepower cars in general. Uh, so we encode that to the color. So now the color of how they're plotted is encoded to the origin column in the data frame. And you can see now that we get a legend which says which country it's from. Let's make that even clearer. We're going to encode the text. So rather than the point, we're going to encode the text of the, that column to be the mark on the plot. Uh, now that's a little messy though. Like, so let's see if we could do something better here. Let's add a transform where we just take the first letter of that country and we make that a new column in the data frame called origin i. So this little DSL here is letting us specify that in JavaScript. And now I change it to origin i. And indeed, we get just the first letter here plotted. Cool. Uh, so just a reminder where to check it out. So the website's vegasviz.org. Um, it's pretty beta at the moment, so definitely try it out. We want feedback. We want people to collaborate and participate in it too, so pull requests are welcome. And uh, we have time for some questions. Hi, uh, Hi, thanks for your presentation. You're welcome. Um, I'm very curious, uh, how mature, mature is, is this library? Are you using it in a production by Netflix? Uh, well, for us, production is a strange concept because we're researchers. Okay. So a lot of our work is research. So it, it does make it to production eventually, but it, it's a slightly different use case. But yes, we are using it day to day. Uh, it is very new, though. Uh, so the project's really, it's not even, I'd say it's at a beta stage at the moment. So okay. uh, definitely worth trying, uh, give it a go, you will find bugs, but give us the feedback, we will fix them. Okay, thanks. Um, hi, uh, probably a stupid question, I'm not familiar with Vega, so uh, um, I assume that you also provide some kind of a um, um, vector graphics output, like uh, independent of the, you can use it without a notebook, right? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question is, is the output some kind of vector output? Uh, and there's actually two options. So uh, it's rendered using HTML, and the two options are, one of them it renders into an HTML canvas, so that's raster, not vector. But the other option is we can also render into SVG, which is vector, and we support both. Any more questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Here. here. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I do have the feeling that you're going to make my life a lot easier now, but <laughs> if my boss asks me, can you change this color into, oh, I don't like this lime green, give me blue, or I don't like this blue, give me red. 
Uh, this happens a lot, actually. And in yeah. matplotlib, I usually just start fiddling sympathize. with the parameters. And then in the end, it kind of looks like what he wants, but not really. Uh, how customizable is a plot in Vegas? Uh, it's actually very customizable. So definitely colors. They can all be customized. Uh, but there's actually several hundred options uh, for customizing every aspect from the way that there's things are padded between the elements to uh, how the scales are generated. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of configuration options. You can even define your own shape, right? You can even define your own shape by defining a, a vector output in SVG, and that gets used instead. And is this doc well documented? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Documentation, what's that? Uh, <laughs> uh, Yes, uh, so, so one thing I should be clear about too is like most of what we've done is really we've provided a wrapper on top of this pre-existing JavaScript like a, a Vega Lite and that is fairly well documented around all this stuff. So they're the ones that are really, I should make clear, you know, doing all the, the cool stuff here with the, having those configuration options. But yeah, uh, it's all exposed up through Vegas. Uh, documentation, something we could use some improvement on. Hi, uh, you mentioned that Vegas can do aggregation, and how does aggregation work with, with Spark? On the Korean side, or uh, <laughs> it's yeah. translated to Spark operation on data frames? Uh, great question. So the question was, how does the aggregation in Vega, Vegas uh, work with the aggregation that's already in Spark? Uh, so they are two separate mechanisms. So the aggregation we do on our side is in the client side, actually done in the JavaScript. Uh, when it renders. So how we're thinking of it is the two are uh, quite complementary. Uh, so what, how you should think about it is your big data kind of lifting should be done in Spark because that's the right language to do it in. And then you should be reducing your data set down to uh, something with maybe, you know, tens of thousands of points to visualize because you, you can't see any more than that on the screen anyway. But then when you're doing the visualization, if you just want something quick in terms of being able to bin things or aggregation more at that kind of visualization layer, uh, then you can do it easily in Vegas. Okay, I think there were a few questions that side. Can I just check, anyone over here have a question whilst I'm here? Oh, yes. Uh, just out of curiosity, so is it actually also producing uh, JavaScript code? Uh, so what it actually produces is it produces an iframe. Within the iframe, there's HTML and JavaScript code, and the rendering is done using that JavaScript code. Okay. Yeah. I think there were a few more questions on that side. Let's just go back. Great talk. Uh, my question would be, what, are, what do they need server-side for running Vegas? Uh, because you, you injecting this iframe, did I need some kind of uh, library to, to run it uh, at ongoing to Vegas? Uh, no, so, it, so everything that's required to do the rendering is baked into the iframe. Uh, we do make a call out to uh, fetch D3, which is a standard JavaScript library, but that's used by everyone, so it's a bit like jQuery type ubiquity, so uh, apart from that, everything else is baked in there. Thank you. Uh, would the visualization happen directly on the data frames, or would it collect uh, everything, all the data points from the data frame and then visualize it? How would it be different by, instead of uh, using Python and calling matplotlib in your notebooks instead of using Vegas? Uh, so the question is, if, if I understand correctly, is how is it different from using Python and matplotlib? Um, so de definitely, I, I, so the idea I don't think is to try and place a competitor in the Python space, because if you're in Python, there's not only matplotlib, there's other great libraries. Uh, actually, a library in Python doing a very similar thing to what we've done is called Altair, which is also resting on top of Vega Lite using that same JavaScript engine. Um, so if you're in Python, I, I think you should be using one of those libraries. The gap that we saw is that there was nothing available in Scala uh, and Spark. And most of the work we do, we like to work in Scala because it's more natural for us. 
Um, but then the workflow that you have, uh, those of you who, who do this, is that you do all your stuff in Scala, and then you have to somehow hand off the data to Python to use matplotlib. Um, if you're in Databricks, they have some tricky stuff that kind of works OK. That makes that sort of seem like not too much of a chore. Uh, if you're in something like Zeppelin, it's a big pain. Uh, so really, it was the idea was to pr plug that gap in Scala. If I, if I uh, run the visualization on a data frame which is uh, distributed ac across different executors, would it collect everything and then try to visualize it? Would it, or would it, uh, how would it do it? Oh yes, uh, so the question is, if you're running on a distributed data set like we are, uh, ha does it collect everything? And the answer is yes, we do. So first we, we see the size of the data, so we do a count on it. And if it's over a certain size, we downsample it and collect it. Thank you. Yeah. I think time for one more question, if anyone has one. No? Oh, one. OK. Last question then. Thank you. You mentioned that in the introduction that uh, interactivity is one use case uh, appropriate for Vegas. How does it work? Can you elaborate it? Interactivity. Oh, interactivity. Uh, great question. Uh, so does it work with interactivity? So at the moment, it doesn't. Uh, but the next version of Vega Lite, that, that JavaScript library that we use, uh, that is building in support for interactivity. So as soon as that is out in Vega Lite, we'll support it in Vegas as well. And I think they're targeting kind of Q1 next year, but we'll see. Okay, great. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.